So do we see then? Um, yeah. Hmm. Hey, uh, everybody. Hi, everybody. Hey, guys. <laughs> um, so uh, there must be some sort of snafu. We were supposed to have a guest on today, and um, he has not jumped in or reached out to me. I met, emailed him. So we what got ghosted. Well, so what <laughs> we're going to do um, is we're going to try to uh, – we, we went through and did a quick uh, discussion, and we decided – uh, this there's a good article out there from DungeonMaster.com that we are going to cover where it says 10 most common mistakes Dungeon Masters and players make in 5th edition D&D. Um, so obviously we um, are just kind of eyeballing this. So it's good. I think it'll. Be, I think it'll be fun. I think it'll be something that's a little bit different than what we normally do. I won't be as prepared as far as show notes. So we're going to do what we do in Dungeons and Dragons and just roll with it. Um, but before all that, we still have our intro <laughs> spiel. So hello and welcome, heroes, to the Crit Academy. I am your host Justin. I'm your co-host Ian. And I'm your co-host Austin. <laughs> <laughs> We hope to inspire you with creative content that we can bring with you on your next adventure. Or in this case, uh, this current adventure, because it's quite <laughs> one already. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Um, so, uh, thank you for joining us today here at Kirk Academy Studios, where everything's made up and your roles don't matter. That's right. Your roles like a D&D player without a D20. I'll take another crack there, but I decided not to. Good call. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, uh, before we get into the, the, the main topic today, I do want to take a moment to talk about a fantastic, uh, actual play that I am going to be a player on this Friday, which is May 21st at 6 30, um, Pacific, I think, or seven, it's seven thirty my time. Uh, I'm really excited. It's called Initiative and Intrigue. If you remember, we had Alex Baum on, and we're super excited to, to have her on. I see she's in the chat. Yeah, she's in the chat right now. So, hey, um, I'm really excited for her. It's <laughs> 630 Central uh, time. And uh, so I'm super excited for that. I am playing one of my personal favorite characters, Brick. A chef. He's a good time. Yeah, he do good time. Uh, I'm really excited. He's a chef, <laughs> half work, a lot of fun. Please, please come and watch us. You can uh, you can come and join us at uh, twitch.tv slash Alex Bomb. Alex is spelled A-E-L-X. Um, please come check it out, or you'll see I'll be doing a bunch of blow-up posts uh, this week. So uh, please, please come check us out. Help us make this super successful. All the, all the uh, special uh, watchers and people who interact, um, she's got this cool little program coming down where you guys can race to summon and revive a dead god. Um, so I'm super excited. I think that's the coolest thing ever. I think it's very, very clever on her part, and I can't wait to see... Uh, how it unfolds. Hopefully we don't die super early. <laughs> if you do, just make Brick Jr. the second or something. Um, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, I might Jr. actually have already built a uh, mortar. So, uh... <laughs> <laughs> So oh, let's uh, we'll just keep that on the we'll keep that on the Rick. DL for now. So. <laughs> That's pretty good. <laughs> so uh, please come uh. and uh, check that out, uh, Alex. If you're watching, please drop a link uh, in the the the, the uh, chat there, and uh, let's do this yeah. <laughs> um before we get to our main topic though we like to start off every episode by giving away fat loots this episode is no different austin would you like to tell us about our rpg fat loot giveaway today absolutely our rpg fat loot giveaway today is the into the forest of worms temple of the demonic cult now, the adventure kicks off in the Boreskir Bridge with a caravan escort making its way to the gnomish town of Hard Buckler before delving into the Forest of Worms. Uh, three worms. side quests with different twists add spice to this adventure. Restless undead from a past battle threaten a farmhouse on the tradeway. A strange statue with magical tears sought by a wizardess. A knoll and his family have forsaken their evil god and seek solace and an ability to raise his family in peace. That sounds very counterintuitive. That... <laughs> it says raise this family in peace. I'm thinking like necromancy? <laughs> Hold on. 
<laughs> Wait a minute. Oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> uh, our winner today is Stephen Lusk1983. Congratulations. You are the winner of this awesome product, I hope. Tell us about it, because that sounds pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. Uh, congratulations. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but don't worry if you didn't win, because you can head over to createacademy.com and always subscribe your chance to win. We give away products every week, and you some might get something amazing like this just literally next week. So, hey, keep an eye out. <laughs> Please do. It's super... Uh... Uh, we well, I, easy. <laughs> yeah, and I'd like to take a moment to uh, thank all the the content creators who submit this content for us to give away. Um, you can head on over to critacademy.com slash post slash episode 220. Um, there is a link to these products. If it sounds something you're interested in, uh, please consider checking them out. Maybe browse through their collection because uh, they're, they're the reason we can give away uh, free loot. So even if you don't win, you can still uh, swing by and check that stuff out. Uh, yeah. All right, I'm cl- I've got like a million windows open from me trying to search stuff <laughs> for interesting topics to discuss. Mm-hmm. Uh, all right, so I with that, I think we can move on to our main topic today, which is 10 most common mistakes dungeon masters and players make in 5e D&D. Now, up front, this is an article from DungeonMaster.com. We did not make this, um, so we may or may not uh, disagree uh, with some of the 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 details here but i'm looking forward we really scrambled to grab something at the last second uh we also should note this was made in april 29th of 2016 so there could (laughs) be some uh so Mm -hmm. yeah there could be but we're gonna who cares? We'll, we'll fly by it. If we notice it and we realize that right. it's been routed, who cares? We'll just say, like, oh, this has changed now. We now all should know this as this rule now, and we won't worry about it too much, hopefully. So, All right, uh, so let's talk about the very first one. Surprise. Uh, <laughs> I love this guy. It says, repeat after me. There is no such thing as a surprise round in 5e. Don't believe me. Oh, there is no such thing as a surprise round in 5e. <laughs> yeah. uh, don't believe me? Look it up. The first round of combat can functionally uh, function differently than normal in some cre- uh, if some creatures, friendly or hostile, are surprised. This is usually based on who's hidden, who's not, but there are other factors that come in play. Um, and don't even get uh, the Dungeon Master started on the... What the hell is that word? Ambascu... Abas- Ambi- Ambuscade Am- action? Like ambush. Ambush skade ra- action rangers Ambuscade? get. I don't know. Yep. Anyways. On the unearthed arcana. So in. Yeah, no, we don't. We won't worry. About right, right. That. In in past D and D, uh, in past D and D editions, it was an entire round. In yep. fifth edition, uh, it really is very much a condition. Yeah. It's a condition. Yeah. It That's affects some people. It doesn't affect others. Uh, I think. Uh, uh, that's very kind of you. Alex is saying if we want a, uh, uh, a guest, she'd happy to uh, drop on, uh, drop in. Wish I would have reached out to you before the show started because that would have been great. But uh, um, so uh, the the so the surprise round is something I have seen and people still treat it as a round. It is not a round. It is in fact a condition. Um, is there any other strange abnom- uh, uh, anomalies that uh, you guys have noticed uh, with something like that? I'm just reading the end of this, but I just I did pull up the surprise condition on D and D Beyond, mm-hmm. and obviously it mentions like d- the DMs comparing stealth checks to perception. But mm-hmm. the last sen- sentence is, if you are surprised, you can't take your you can't move or take an action to, on your first turn of the combat. You can't take a reaction until your until that turn ends. Okay. Mm-hmm. So I mean, it's kind of one of those things where I get what they're saying with this one, but this always struck me as a weird technicality in the sense of. Well, yes, but if that makes any sense. Yeah, that totally does. I feel like it's just officially not called a surprise round, mm-hmm. whereas it's just a condition that the people who are surprised yeah. are inflicted on. That's really yeah, the right, best right. way to look at it. Yeah, I like, agree with that. Like, like, well, yes, it's true, but at the same time, every time somebody brings this up, I'm like, okay, but you're nitpicking at this point. Yeah, it's, it's functionally so... the same. It really is. But there are certain things that would cause some differences. So, like, if you're yeah. playing, let me look up the rogue assassin here. 
because I know they have something, I think, if your opponent is surprised, that would mean that surprised is a condition. Yeah. Let me see if I... Yeah, you have an advantage on attack rolls against any creature that hasn't taken a turn in the combat yet. If they're surprised, they technically haven't taken a turn in the combat yet, because they're surprised. They haven't had a chance to do a move. So... Oh yeah, and any score hit you score against a creature that is surprised is a critical hit. Surprised being a functionally a condition at that point. So yeah, yeah. Did I miss something? John's like dot dot dot. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. Uh, with, going off your typo, yes. What was my typo? I'm not gonna read it out loud. <laughs> uh, yeah, we. <laughs> oh. Okay then. Sorry. <laughs> So what is the so what what is the next one there, uh, uh, Austin? Sure. So this one I think is actually pretty common. Uh, initiative. Uh, two players, any monster, all roll the same number on initiative. Who goes first? Uh, in previous editions, ties were settled by the dex modifier or dex score. Still, I think that's a fine rule, <laughs> personally. Yep. But yeah, uh, in five e, that's not the case. When players get the same result on their initiative check, it's up to them to decide amongst themselves who goes first. The deck score, the deck modifier, and even the number on the d20 are all irrelevant. From they a general rules perspective. They can just talk it out okay. and decide. Of course, if they can't decide, then they can roll off or find some other way to settle the dispute. So just looking at their deck scores or modifiers, I'm not sure. Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, likewise, if a bunch of monsters get the same result, the DM can decide what order they go in. So really, it's just saying they're trying to simplify it and kind of just say you can just decide you don't have to like do you know you have higher decks you have to go first <laughs> kind of thing now i remember reading now apparently this article says uh now i remember reading somewhere that when the dm and the players tie the players always go ahead of the monsters i've scoured through the php and al players guide and can't find that written anywhere has that been Maybe cleared was, up since then I have no idea, but okay. it says there's a reference page number that says uh, number 189 on the player's handbook. Mm -hmm. uh, so, maybe it's something that was in the D&D &D next play test. In any case, I've been applying this rule since 5e. It was launched and it works very well. If anyone knows where this rule came from, let me know in the comments below. It yeah, seems, so, but... let's, let's, so let's focus on that. So um, that's one of those little things that I think isn't generally a big deal. But yeah. being able to decide who goes can be very advantageous. Um, yeah. depending on the classes the or the groups. Yeah, yeah. For sure. And yeah, as we said before, I think this is what was one of those butt situations. Because let, let's be real here. A dex or die result does seem to be a reasonable way of doing a quick tiebreaker on the spot. Yeah, but it is strange yeah, exactly. that there wouldn't be a ruling for that, though. Yeah. Um, but I guess it doesn't matter. The, the fact that there's a lot of missing rules for a lot of things, I guess. But that seems like one you think yeah. that they would... Uh, they would include I up think. On. yeah, yeah. And once again i did pull up the initiative on dnd beyond and what was it says if a tie occurs the dm decides the order among dm tied creatures mm -hmm. and the players decide the order among their tied characters the dm can decide the order of the ties between a monster and a player character okay and so it's not really like a huge deal to begin with I, right, I mean, right. at the end of the day yeah it's just saying turn order it's not like it's you know completely game breaking or anything like that right so I think right I think that is a okay. You want to take movement? Uh, uh, yeah, Ian. Movement. Movement has changed for the better in 5e. You can now <laughs> move throughout your turn. Move, attack, move, move some more, attack some more, move again, attack again using your bonus action, and move even more. You are no longer forced to do all of your moving at the beginning or end of your turn. Break it up in five foot increments and use them when you need to. Just be sure you understand how opportunity attacks works. And more of that below, apparently. And uh, one thing about the, the it's a dash oh. action. This replaces the double move coming in previous editions. It's the same thing. Right, uh, right. Think, think of it. I'm just going to stop there because it's kind of, uh, yeah. I spot a wild Alex. Hello, Crikey. guys. I heard, I heard that oh. there was some, uh, some meat and some helps. Yeah. 
There we go. We'll uh, hit the transition, and you're popped in. Welcome, Alex. Thanks for jumping in and filling in. Oh, everyone. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's not like I got have a screen here. Yeah. Uh, yep. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, I got you. Thanks for pointing that out. Um, thanks for joining us. So what do we think about – so do you got the link there, uh – Oops. No, you send me the link to the Discord. You You're in the chat, so oh, scroll up. Yeah, I got okay. it. Somebody send her the, uh, the, uh, Twitch link to I the. I can just send it oh, to you there. Yeah. I if that works. I see it. There we go. Yes. All right. So what what is what was going on with movement here? Because honestly, I was trying to get Alex in here and was not paying attention. So basically, they're saying movement is changed for the better because you're allowed to move. Uh, you don't have to do your full move in the beginning of your turn, yes. and that's it. Yeah. Uh, you can kind you of break it up. it up. So you can move, then you can attack, and then you can decide to move again if you need to, or uh, you can. And if you do, you can attack again, and then you can move again. And so as long as you have more movement, but right. basically explaining dash is basically just another move action, effectively, even though it's a standard action. But yeah. yeah. <laughs> And that's something that uh, gets overlooked a lot. There's a, a few classes, I think, that can really get the most out of this. And Alex, please uh, feel free to jump in here if you agree or disagree. Is that being able to break your movement up and hit multiple targets definitely has its benefits in certain, situation, certain situations beyond just, oh, this monster is dead. The one thing that came to uh, mind for me previously was the um, the one of the ranger features that... I think it's Colossal Slayer that does more damage to something that is hurt. So mm -hmm. there was more than one time where I would run as a monk and hit one target, then run and hit another target just so that the um, the ranger could get the benefit of hitting the other target that he was basically distracting or whatever while the rest of us were focusing on the other one. And something like that didn't used to be possible with the normal rules. Or another yeah. good example, too, would be like a dueling fighter running through minions that only have one hit point right right the thing that i actually think about with the movement that you couldn't do in 3.5 that is just so helpful in 5e is minotaur mm -hmm. you actually can gore people by running 15 feet and then goring them and then you can run mm -hmm. another 15 feet and then gore someone else um what it just yep. mm, cherry on top of a fight right there let me tell you <laughs> so that's like what i think of whenever i think of the movement and i remember in 3.5 it wasn't like that um yeah. and the other thing that comes out of this is ranged and spellcasters because you can run mm -hmm. out blast something and then go hide again in fact i built an entire monk character based around this concept which i think uh ian and the team end up nicknaming daffy because i was basically just running around like a coward i guess i don't remember the, how that you know came i drove in, you but... a few times with my warlock step around the corner Elf yes class step, step back, back around the corner and that can be <laughs> such a powerful tactic that can mm -hmm. totally uh increase the 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 difficulty for the the game master or the dungeon master because if you've got a sure. group of ranged people that are actively running different directions popping out from behind a, a an alley or up on a rooftop and then running and hiding somewhere not necessarily taking the hide action but getting out of line of sight mm -hmm. is a huge tactical advantage for players so and a and bundle. And monsters. The players can do it. Yeah. The DM can do it. Yes. yes. But that's something that easily <laughs> gets thing. overlooked because we've been, we the game has been around for so long that for those of us that have played it longer, that kind of mm -hmm. is something you just forget. Uh, and I see that. So, uh, Alex, would you, good, what, yeah. would you like to tell us about. I was going to say that was good on a movement. <laughs> yeah. Would you like to tell us about the bonus action? Absolutely. So uh, the bonus action, many players who came from 4E liken the bonus action to a minor action. Although they are similar, they are not the mm -hmm. same. One, you cannot downgrade your action to uh, or your movement to take a second bonus action. Yep, you get that. one bonus action per round, that's it. And then uh, two, many bonus actions can only be taken when you do something specific with your action. For yes. example, if you make a melee attack with your attack action, then you can make an offhand one with a bonus action. You cannot make an offhand attack if you do not make the first attack action, like dodge or drink a potion or things like that. Absolutely. I think the people overlook that, though, because let's face it, it does sound like a silly rule, but yeah, raw, that is how it goes. Yeah. Yeah. And that's something that, once again, uh, people that are newer to the game kind of, oh, what can I use on my bonus action? I want to use my bonus action to do this, 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 or the other thing. And they, they don't realize that you need a power or an ability that tells you you can do that. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and then there's not, and honestly, I feel like that limited it in a little bit more way than like the minor action or was it a swift action in previous editions? Something similar. 3.5 is a swift action. Um, yeah. And I think that that made it so it was a little confusing for some people going into it. So I can totally understand that. But uh, the fact that you can't just do it is also kind of, so I have a bonus action. Yes. But I can't use a bonus action. No. <laughs> yes. Maybe. Yes. I'm not sure. <laughs> but that's kind that of, the, that the, once what again, your <laughs> it depends on what powers you have, right? Yeah. Um, though it is worth noting that if you're wielding a light weapon, even if you're a, let's say you're wielding a dagger as a wizard and you've got two of them, you can still make an offhanded attack. So if you've got yeah. nothing else you're going to do and you're out of spell slots, though in most cases a cantrip is probably better, uh, but if you've got a high dex, you know, a 2d4 attacks, um, adds up to more than what you're, uh, if you hit mo- with both, they're going to add up more than your generic, you know, cantrip at low levels, but, uh, or your blood right. finger. so yeah. Right. <laughs> so there are some options to that. Uh, have you guys seen this used wrong in any other cases? Um, Not- I haven't, I've seen really? bonus actions used wrong by a lot of like new DMS that don't come fully grasp the concept of like, mm-hmm. you know, um, chaining things but i i just want to say that uh as as a person who is dating a power gamer <laughs> uh power gamers love this bonus actions in 5e uh they mm-hmm. because bonus actions in 5e are where you can really like ding 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 like chain things together <laughs> and then it can become in really intense <laughs> Sorry about the dogs. Yes, I agree 100%. And actually, I would like to get point out that um, this doesn't just apply. Dog, would you please be quiet? <laughs> this doesn't just no, apply to the players. It also applies to monsters. Monsters may have a power and ability, um, but they still have access to all the actions and even the bonus actions that would be available to the uh, to the to the character. So I've noticed yep. that there's some monsters I can't I can't think of one right hand that can use daggers but don't have multi attack. But if you give them another dagger, they don't add their uh, additional damage, uh, the extra modifier damage, but they still can extra do the 1d4 on top of it. Um, Mm -hmm. And that's something that I don't know if uh, is just kind of left out by uh, the 5th edition design, or if it was designed that you are to use it that way and nobody does. Um, is there a, what monster uses a dagger? Is it the kobold or is it the uh, the goblin? I don't know. I think goblins, goblins? use dagger, but I'm I think trying to do. remember. It's not pack tactics, but there's another feature that some that you can have that's like if you are within five feet of another co- of your kin, you can take an a, take an action to attack as well. And so that's another way that you can take a bonus action to attack or a reaction. But that's just another way to like chain those little small things to end up something really yeah. good. Yeah. Yeah. I'm trying to I actually look at it. It doesn't look like it's the goblin, but I agree 100% with you. Uh, goblin's got a scimitar. So, but those are something to, uh, to keep in mind if you are rocking a, uh, 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 the cultist uses a dagger. They can make two attacks, uh, even though yes. it doesn't say that they can. So, uh, right. All right. Uh, so uh, I think we got a little bit out of uh, the bonus action one. Let's talk about yeah. opportunity attacks. Opportunity attacks. The five foot step or shift is no longer a thing in 5e tier. Uh, if you back away from an enemy moving out of the threatening range, then the enemy can take a free swing at you. It's called of opportunity attacks. Um, once inside the monster's threat area, usually all squares adjacent to the enemy, you can move freely wherever you want. This is a powerful tactic, tactic as a player and a monster for positioning. I've recent, and I'll, I'll tell you about that in a second because it came into play quite a bit yesterday in the game I run for my patrons. Um, so you can move freely as long as you remain in their reach. It's important to remember some monsters have long reaches too, which that applies in that uh, in the same same way, right? Uh, mm-hmm. So if you've got uh, the speed, you can literally just run circles around your enemy and they will not get an opportunity attack now remember that in 5e a creature only gets one reaction so if they do take an opportunity attack against you they won't get another one against your ally so if you're a bit meatier of a character um maybe you're willing to provoke that just so your ally wizard can get away because he was just being hammered on by the by the you know the big giant ogre um so 
Uh, unless your enemy goes between you and your ally, then you've got a problem, which is a whole other thing. In yeah. 5e, fewer things uh, provoke opportunity attacks than in previous editions. Um, like, a good example would be standing up used to provoke an op attack. It doesn't anymore, uh, which... Yeah. I think some people still homebrew anyway, and they're just like, I don't care. Um, that's the way I'm playing it, because you're basically getting up from a prone position. I'm going to kick you in the face while you're down. Um, but it mm -hmm. is worth noting that uh, the, uh, what's it say here? And, and if you do make a ranged attack while you're prone or trying to get up, the enemy does have, uh, does not get an opportunity attack, but does impose disadvantage. So uh, I want to talk about the, the running in circles around a character, because that's actually so... Po por important depending yeah. on the surroundings uh yesterday i ran the advent the monthly adventure for my patrons where they were climbing up a basically a, a ventilation system that had like a, a a set of like stairs and layers going around the outside and the bottom was filling up with scalding hot boiling water and so the 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 orcs that they were fighting their goal wasn't to try to stab them most of the time they were just choking them and throwing them off the edge so they could easily just rotate and shove and it made that whole encounter so much more uh dangerous because they basically could run at him full force and then uh rotate around him and then just push him off and that yeah. happened more than once so uh sorry i, I got long-winded on the the opportunity attacks what do you guys think about this what ways have you seen it used incorrectly oh so i just want to say that there, there is a reason. I, j I just recently had something with this in my game too. Um, my players were fighting a Merilith, mm -hmm. and um, a Merilith yes. has the reactive feature, meaning that they can take a reaction every turn in combat, and that's specifically made so that you can do a reaction, a re uh, attack of opportunity mm -hmm. every turn. And I was like, wow, that's not. I just don't know why you would need that on a CR sixteen monster. Oh no. <laughs> opportunity attacks are just way underutilized to yes. be honest oh they can be killer mm -hmm. and it really worth noting too though that this entry on opportunity attacks also doesn't mention the many ways around it because i'm actually shocked it didn't mention disengage like, even though shifting or five foot steps not a thing disengage still is an option mm -hmm. the mobile feet for that matter and right. there's also class features a lot like get around it too and I guess like tele teleporting is also worth mentioning as well. <laughs> yeah. So they're, yeah. they're always around. And I think uh, she makes a good point. And anybody that's watched the monster variants that I've been making, one thing that I constantly try to do is give legendary actions or give you uh, reactions. I think reactions uh, are extremely underutilized. In fact, in the SRD, which is like the, the, the free you can publish content out of it that Watsi released, I think there's only one reaction power that doesn't belong to like a big powerful monster and i think that's the parry that one of the 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 guards or something gets and that just shows how not used enough that is and you can in my opinion i would much rather give up an extra multi attack and give it a really cool reaction that it does on the player's turn because the players don't expect that and it breaks up the monotony of them going and then my bad guy going and then them going especially if you got like a a, a big bad boss but which is what legendary mm -hmm. actions kind of are but giving more yeah. uh more uh short burst powers um that a reaction is definitely something we can do better uh but the opportunity attack i think didn't they do the um build like the tunnel fighter or something that had infinite op attacks and that quickly broke that character like sentinel and yeah wielding so. like a pole arm and Sentinel is banned else. at my table for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> Stupid tunnel fighter. Fair. Uh, uh, my boyfriend, who's the power gamer, that's why it's banned, honestly. Right. Yeah, I'm you broke it. I'm surprised uh, <laughs> I didn't get the banish spell banned at Justin's table, just saying. Yeah, I uh, I worked with it, um, but it definitely pissed me off more than once. Um, <laughs> is anybody not uh, gone? Uh... I, I do kind of want to make a note in in chat actually it says uh it's blood score saying do y'all think disarming is useless in 5e no and it say he also says or they i guess uh as i understand it you have to spend an action or other limited resource for the target to expend their free item interaction no attack of opportunity provoked for picking up your weapons near foe or anything your version it depends no, uh, keep that in mind, because the answer to that is literally in his text. If a person disarms a monster, they, can, okay, kick, they can kick it away for free. Yeah. 
So disarm <laughs> and then kick it away. Ten feet away, they ain't gonna pick it up unless they got a really long arms. So maybe a bugbear. I think I would rule that to to be a reaction. Cause like think about it, you're reacting to the person disarm the cause the disarm reaction kick the weapon away. I think I would rule kicking weapon away as a reaction, but. Uh, personally, disarming, um, I think it's extremely underutilized. Mm -hmm. I don't know why no one's tried it at my table yet. I'm so excited I because, like, it's just, I don't know, it just seems like such a fun um, extra thing that is not often thought about. Right. I think the problem with disarming is because people see it on the Battlemaster specifically, I don't think they think they can do it, do it. as an action to begin with. Right. I don't think we, it's like something that's noticeably seen because they think, oh, it's a feature on the battle master, so I have to be a battle master to disarm said person nope. as long as I have this feature. But um, and yeah. I, I see what Alex is saying, but for clarification, raw you uh, interacting with an object is free. Um, so and that I think we actually had a player tip once that talked about the power of using an action to force an enemy to drop an item, which is one of the uh, things that they say you can do in the player's handbook because yeah, an ogre is big and strong when it's wielding a tree for a weapon, but when it's, when it's attack goes down to its strength modifier, that is a significant reduction. So, uh, I, what I've seen a player do is one person disarm it, another person kick it away. And then a third person on their turn going, or the second, another person go and grab it and pick it and drag it away. Um, significantly gimping, uh, my, my monster, which, you know, Kudos to them for doing that. So I would say that it is not a uh, it is not useless. In fact, it is a very sound and very potent tactic, which is exactly why I think uh, Alex decided it would take a reaction, which totally worth doing it using the reaction I, I is the interaction. I see that making sense so, too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so uh, all right. So yeah. Uh, was there anything else for the uh, the opportunity attack? Uh, uh, I don't think so. Do you want me to take the next one? Uh, yes. I'm trying to think. I feel like there was something else I wanted to say about the opportunity attack because, uh, oh, it's important to know that forced movement doesn't trigger these. Some people forget that and they think, oh, if I knock yes. them back or push them back or grab them and drag them, um, forced movement does not do that. So, but there is a bit of ways around that. I think, uh, what is it that Tasha's... The, the thing that I makes was, people run away. What is that? What is that? That I power? I was just about to ask you guys, how do you, because they say that in the, in the player, and they say that in the PHB, and they say it in the Dungeon Master's Guide, but they don't say anything about magical forcing. Yes. Like fear or, you know, something mm -hmm. like that. So. How do you guys rule that? Personally, I would say if they're running away of their own volition, that's an op attack. Even though it's yes. magic, mm -hmm. it's a magic compulsion, I would still say that they are, they are moving away and it's not the traditional force to being pushed, tripped, gra dragged, or anything like that. At least that's how yeah. I would do it. It's kind of like, because yeah, if you're if you're afraid, right? Like, no one's, like, you're not really, like, held, like, being held down or being thrown by another person, right? You're kind of just turning around and running from them, which yeah. is the same exact thing as kind of, like, what would be, like, an op attack, except maybe... You know, you can flavor it saying like, oh, but I'm still looking at the guy. Well, yeah, you're looking at the guy, but you're also running away from the guy. He's still going to hit you. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. Whereas like, I don't know, it's too much going on when you think about like somebody grabbing somebody and like you're physically moving mm -hmm. them. That It's like, how do you get like a clean op attack in a, like a realistic standpoint, yeah. I guess, if that makes sense. So I could see that being the oh it's flavored this way because like well if i'm physically moving this person are you gonna attack my arms well that doesn't make sense <laughs> right um and blood scored makes a really good uh narrative uh example being pushed you can still maintain a stance for defense but if you're feared and you're just turning around and running away there's no stance it's gone <laughs> yeah, yeah that makes sense too <laughs> so, i like that a lot all right uh do you want to take the the next one there uh austin sure so concentration yes a uh, big one uh, many spells require the spellcaster to maintain concentration. Mm -hmm. These spells remain active until one of three things happens. Uh, the spellcaster casts a different spell that also requires concentration. You can only have one concentration spell active at a time. The new one trumps the old one. Kind of makes sense. You can't concentrate on two different things. <laughs> Doesn't really work like that. Yeah. Uh, the spellcaster is required to make a concentration saving throw and fails. Happens. Uh, or the spellcaster falls unconscious. You can't concentrate on anything if you're not conscious. Sorry to burst everyone's <laughs> bubble. <laughs> uh, while a spellcaster has a concentration spell in effect, they can cast other spells, they just can't cast another concentration spell. Right. 
or the first one stops. So a cleric can cast Bless in round one, and then they can cast Sacred Flame every round after that. If a spellcaster has a concentration spell in effect and they take damage, they must make a concentration saving throw, which is a constitution save. Uh, the DC is either 10 or half the damage taken, so unless the single attack deals 22 damage or more, the DC is 10. If the spellcaster fails to save, the spell stops. Remember that a save is required every time the spellcaster takes damage. So if a level, if a spellcaster hit by a level 1 magic missile would have to make three separate saves because it's every instance of damage. Yes. Oh, uh, my gosh. Which I think is a big – that's where the, the big rule, I think, is coming into play mm -hmm. here. Uh, concentration works exactly the same for monsters and PCs, so keep it in mind. Yeah, whatever. We kind of figured that. Yes. The rules apply both ways. It doesn't. There's no special cases. But right. I think the one we need to talk about for sure is the – if you're hit by a level 1 magic missile, that's three saves, baby. <laughs> doesn't <laughs> care Doesn't care that it's one, one – a little bit of damage. Right. It, three in, separate instances is a power – I would argue that magic missile is single-handedly one of the best concentration-breaking powers – in the game aside from just a, a brute strength and lots of damage. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that, because even though it's one three with a DC of 10, it's still a chance you're going to fail at a 50, what 50%, maybe, maybe a little, it'd probably be a little lower. Wouldn't it be like a 30%, but still, yeah. um, I think if you want to kind of like look at it this way, it's like imagining you're getting a hit with a magic fist three times. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably the best way to probably think about the whole magic missile thing. Because I think the idea is that they can just kind of choose their targets, right? But yeah. you just get chose three times or something yeah. like that. Yeah. What do you guys uh, think? What have you guys run into as far as concentration issues? I mean, for the most part, I think it's right. And something I'm not really seeing anywhere, it, and it's kind of one of those things I can't don't see why not, is I wouldn't see a spell because like, I'm just not gonna concentrate the spell anymore and just move on. <laughs> oh yeah, you can just stop. Know, it's, I don't see anything in the rules that allow you to, but I can't think of a reason why you couldn't either. So yeah. yeah. It's, uh, I actually had to look this up. It's a free action to drop concentration. Okay. Oh, nice. Oh, okay. Cool. Yeah. There and we go. there you have Let's it. Go. Yeah. <laughs> From um, the great Alex. The reason why I know that is because concentration has consistently at every table that I have that I have DM'd every table that I've been at it has been an issue uh, of confusion so I understand why mm -hmm. it's on this list because I don't know two people who have the same understanding of the concentration rules yeah yep <laughs> um I would say it's worth noting that the reason why powers have concentration is so I would I would argue is, is balance but um the other thing is that it means all the spells that are very powerful can end. Um, let's use Bane for existence. Existence. Example. <laughs> Bane debuffs the enemies. That can be terrible having to roll a D4 and subtract it from your already you know low chance to hit or whatever. So mm -hmm. as a well, monster, <laughs> um, it quickly becomes important for me to end that. Because otherwise, it could last the entire combat counter. So a mm. monster is going to know that there's a, a cleric over chanting and buffing the party. It was like, well, or weakening weakening them in this case, bless or bane, I guess. Um, yeah. A smart monster isn't going to let their let the party have that advantage. So that becomes a significantly uh, more dangerous investment if you're fighting NPCs that actively want to um not be weakened or not have the enemies buffed so your uh your thing keeps jumping on and off ian i don't know why it's very bothersome yeah i think it's catching like a fan or something maybe I think, but it's the ac uh, uh that makes sense um so yeah but i yeah. agree with you i agree that uh you know having bane or bless or you know spiritual weapon or any sort of those or even like if you do summoning types of wizards you um you if you have a monster that has an intelligence of like six or higher, mm -hmm. they are going to understand that that and that that person is buffing everybody, and mm -hmm. they are going to make them a target. Absolutely. And that's like so much fun whenever the players don't realize that the enemies realize. Oh, <laughs> why are you? Why are you always oh, picking on me? It's because you keep buffing everybody. Why wouldn't they do that? Why am I not supposed? <laughs> uh. 
this so, concentration of this because on um, previous editions it was not uncommon before a fight starts for a mage you cast haste giant size bear strength <laughs> laundry list of stuff i'm the barbarian <laughs> then run into battle um all right i think that'll do it for that uh there is one last note uh the meta magic of the twinning effect uh it can do two spells one concentration uh so keep that in mind oh, that no, does no, one spell two targets still have one target so right but it's still just a single concentration right uh so that's a huge way to benefit from that if you are taking the twin magic meta uh, feat, it so it basically allows you to ca cast two concentration spells. I think the first, the one that no, comes to mind. No. <laughs> what do you mean? No, you're not casting two spells. It's you're casting one spell with two targets. <laughs> yes, you're talking about. We're talking about the intent versus the actual literal term. So if I cast um, <laughs> witch bolt. It's still right. one concentration. It's just, and it's hitting two targets. I'm hitting two yeah. targets with one concentration. Bastard. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's move on to the next one. Uh, I know, I think this should be the last one we do here because it is kind of running real Are short we running out of time? All right, fantastic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we'll, because I know we kind of had some interesting points on this one specifically, so I'm, it's a good place to end. It's wrong. Uh, I'm probably going to say it. It's, it's wrong. wrong. <laughs> okay, well, why don't you read it and tell us why it's wrong, Ian? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It says, casting two spells. Yes, you can cast two spells in the same round. The only restriction is that one of them must be a cantrip. Wrong. No. So we also see class casting healing word and the sacred flame cantrip. No, that's wrong. Because what the restriction is, is if you cast a bonus action, the, the, the spell on your action must be a cantrip. That's not the same thing. Yes. Because if you're, if, if you, for example, both class, both class the fighter, you took action surge. Yes, you can cast fireball twice. <laughs> Yes, so and it's they have said in uh, Saint Devi is like yes, there's there's no rule that says you can only cast one spell per turn. It does not exist. <laughs> right, that's something that people have misunderstood. It is worth noting that I'm so nerdy. I made a TikTok when I got my Tasha's book because it made it very clear. <laughs> there's like one little paragraph that says this is how you do it, people. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, I I do agree that um. The, the limit of it must be a cantrip is um, only if you cast a bonus action spell. Yes, so if you cast Healing Word or if you're a sorcerer with the meta magic quicken and you cast fire bolt, Fireball as a bonus action, you're casting a spell as a bonus action. So then the limit comes into play on your main action can only be a cantrip. People, I don't understand how people get confused since Hellish Rebuke, Counterspell, or all spells that can be done in the same turn as something else. So, too, yeah, so. But, but it doesn't matter. It's still, you can still do it in the same turn. So, uh, Alex, do you have any points on this? Oh, I just want to say I've seen friendships end over this. <laughs> <laughs> I have seen friendships end over this. <sighs> like, I stay out of this fight. I'm like, I'm just gonna stay in my corner so with Natasha's. I I want to reiterate for me because I am the dumb guy here who uses no spellcasters. What exactly am I allowed to do? <laughs> so, if you I cast a spell, <laughs> if you cast a spell right. as a bonus action, as okay. a bonus action. You right. can only use your action to cast a cantrip. That's not the same as you can't cast two spells in a turn, which is the common misconception. Some people oh. say you can't cast two spells in a turn. Well, no, that's not the way it is. You can cast Fireball and then Action Surge and cast Fireball again, and that's perfectly allowed because you didn't cast a spell as a bonus action. And... So it stops clerics from healing and fireball. <laughs> I don't know that clerics have so, fireball, but you know what I mean. <laughs> so the stipulation is on the bonus action yes. part. That's the stipulation. And everyone okay. gets so confused by that. And I don't know why. Okay. If you read it, it's very clear. <laughs> like. <laughs> so, so long as I don't cast a spell as a bonus action, and I means that's the reason why I can cast yeah. double fireball if I was like action surgeon. Right. Although Got I would it. also would argue too, if you cast a leveled spell as your regular action, then you can't use a bonus action spell either. Yeah, it's okay. still it's still the limit goes forward and back. 
Thank you for yeah, okay. bringing that up because that's not something – most of you usually it's a one issue. So, all right. Uh, do we have any other topics, uh, any quick things we want to go over? Obviously, uh, we started late and we're still running out of time uh, to cover these 10 things because we talk a lot uh, and we get a lot of good conversation. But we do have to move on right. to our unearthed tips and tricks. Before we do that, is there any other comments you all want to make? Alex? I'll, Austin, I'll just quickly yeah. just mention the title of the next three things. Delay such writing action. No, we're writing – Delaying is not a thing anymore. Short rest. It's one hour, not five minutes. Death saves. There, brother. There, done. <laughs> done and out of the way. Uh, anybody else? Nope. No, that's it. Good. That's good. All right. Uh, well, that'll do it for our sudden main topic today. Uh, yeah. Seven most common mistakes DMs and players make in 5e d and um, because we didn't make it to 10 because we're really trying to stick to and well, yep. we're not going to make an hour since it's, it's seven two, but you get the point. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, so with that, we will move on to our unearth tips and tricks segment. Let's let me click the button. I'm I've got to click the button. There we go. And now what you've all been waiting for our unearth tips and tricks segment where we bring you new and reusable material for both players and DMs. Alrighty, welcome back. Uh, so, our awesome guest, Alex, is going to uh, bring us a character concept today with about 10 seconds notice, so thank you. <laughs> wow. Um, so the character concept that I'm going to bring today is Ideal. Ideal is uh, a tiefling, again, like my past character. Um, she is a purple tiefling with uh, long flowing black hair into a braid and pure white eyes. And um, the thing that she is the most known for is that she is a past adventurer, but unfortunately she ran into a problem with a dragon and this dragon uh, stripped her ability to communicate to the weave, and she was once a wizard, and now she is no longer a wizard. So now instead she makes uh, spell scrolls for people um, at a spell scroll shop, so she can be a shopkeeper, or she can be someone that you see uh, on the road, or something like that. And um, she has a solemnness about her because, of course, she's sad that her connection to the weave is gone. But there is also the possibility of side questing to get a wish spell to get her back, Ooh, her weave. I love that. Oh, my gosh. Like She's one of my favorites. Dude, could you guys totally? Okay, so can, can, I, can I run with this a little bit? Yeah, go for it. So I totally love the idea as a player character who plans to multi-class into magic or take a branch that starts as a more generic. So the artisan background or the merchant guild background thing for the, the shop the shop build, a fighter, rogue, or uh, some other spec uh, build that has no magic. And then either you multi-class at a higher level as your party succeeds in completing the quest of the player to get back in touch with the weed to allow her to draw her magic back in and so that's when she takes the next step but because of the disruption or the connection her magic isn't as strong and she has to relearn everything that she lost um holy crap oh my god that, that is amazing. cool like oh my god having a player uh, i need to form a party i'm forming this party i want to get my magic back can you guys help me <laughs> oh man that could be really fun <laughs> That would be amazing. And that would be such a good, like, um, you know, like a like a guide for you and what that player would ever want to, like, uh, would like to want to pursue or, mm -hmm. like, what quest they would take. That would be, yeah. be really cool for Ideal. I oh, would really man. like that. I, lo I love it. I could, I could really see them, like, classing into, like, one thing, right? And just, like, some non-magically based class. And then when... They finally get all their magic back. You could say you may now class into so and so level wizard or sorcerer or whatever. Oh yeah, at like point. just um, completely respec everything, and because they've obtained all that knowledge back, they're like, oh, I can do this. Class shift, isn't that what it's called? Class shifting, shifting. I have no idea. I have Where no you idea. Go from like paladin to barbarian. Is that a thing? 
Is that the, is that uh, one of the new things? I don't think it's really. I don't think it's actually just in the book. So oh, okay, right. I think it's in the book, but I mean, it's a thing that people do. I think okay. it's called class shifting. That's cool. Like basically a, a yeah. way to, um, hey, I don't want to play this character anymore. Let's do this. So, mm -hmm. um, that's a good way to do it too. Especially if you go in it with, hey, I normally play a wizard. Um, I don't usually play like a barbarian character. But, hey, for the purpose of it, can I start off as a barbarian? We'll plan for this goal. That way, if I don't like it, I've got a story driven out into what I do like. Yeah. That should be a player tip. Yeah, somebody somebody <laughs> snip that and email that it to me. That should be a player tip. We need to, <laughs> we need to record that somewhere. Uh, that's that's funny. very good. That is extremely good. That's something that needs to be talked about, uh, I think. So. Chat totally. And we got a lot out. of that I... character concept. Hey, there <laughs> yeah. we go. <laughs> well, Thirty <laughs> seconds of notice, you go, girl. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that'll do it for our character concept. Thank you so much, Alex. Um, mm -hmm. Our oh, I lost my notes. Hang on. <laughs> our monster you. variant of the podcast is. Ooh, I gotta click the button here. Ian went through the trouble to make these things. Is the chrysalis golem. Uh, so, uh, I, I, I needed a golem for something, uh, I'm working on. So of course I made one, <laughs> the, we have the chrysalis golem, uh, in order to, you're going to start with the origin, the gold dragon wormling stat block. It's going to lose its flying. It's going to lose its fire immunity. It's going to lose its swim, its breath weapon and its bite, but it's going to get a host of new features. We're going to yeah. give it immunities, poison, physical, uh, psychic damage, physical <laughs> poison, psychic, uh, bludgeoning, piercing and slashing from non magical attacks that are animantine uh it's going to have new condition immunities because we're making it a construct right so it's immune to charm ex uh, exhaustion frightened paralyzed petrified poison it has immutable form so it can't be polymorphed or any other bs that the players try we're going to give it the magic <laughs> resistance so not only is it resistance to all your pitiful little weapons but it's resistant to all your magical effects to as well once again i took away its fly didn't change its hp so it had to give somewhere right uh yeah, and of course <laughs> the magic weapons we're gonna give it the uh or its weapon attacks are magical um <laughs> we are this is where it gets interesting so my chrysalis golem i wanted it to focus around sound i wanted the sound to be the the the, the focus focal point <laughs> so we're gonna Bro. give it resonating slam it's a melee attack with a plus six to hit uh it deals one d10 or a d10 plus four bludgeoning damage and become the it becomes sheathed in a resonating energy until the start of the golem's next turn if the target willingly moves five feet or more then it takes an additional d8 thunder damage so that sounds familiar hmm. yep what is, does that sound like booming blade to you because that's what that sounds like to me yeah <laughs> Like mm -hmm. it. We're going to also give it a sonic resonance. It recharges on a five or six. The golem emits a magical sound. Each time it uses its sonic resonance before finishing a short or long rest, the resonance grows louder and the effect is different as detailed below. Each creature within 100 feet of the golem and are able to hear the sonic resonance must make a saving throw. The first resonance. Each creature that fails the DC 13 wisdom save is frightened for one minute. A frightened creature can repeat the save at the end of their turn on a success ending the effect on the second resonance each creature that fails the dc uh 13 wisdom save becomes deafened and frightened for one minute and uh a frightened character is paralyzed instead of just feared and they can repeat the saving throw at each of its uh turns ending the effect on a successful save third resonance each creature makes a dc 13 constitution saving throw a sound erupts from this resonating uh, chrysalis body on a failed save a creature takes uh 4d 10 thunder damage and is knocked prone on a successful save a creature takes half damage and the target is not knocked prone Whew. damn I take a quick comment at this guy already if i may sure uh, this thing is a hoss. <laughs> he come in like a wrecking ball. Should have named it, it Miley. Is painful, yep. and it is cool. <laughs> what? I what love CR it. is it? Oh, uh, I forgot. Three or four or six. I hang on. Uh, Let me check. And wormling. Okay, because I might chuck this at you guys. Because like this. Okay. Okay. Listen. Him in a cave. Oh. Oh snap! And yeah, it's shit falls from the ceiling. 
And like, and I, oh my god. Oh, that would be oh. such a cool. I am so envious of your ability to make monsters. That is, I, I'm. That's the one thing I lack. I cannot make monsters. Girl. I gotta be honest. I totally didn't even make up that power. I stole it and weakened it from the, uh, the roar from one of the uh, sphinxes. I mm -hmm. think. Oh so God. I can't even take credit for that. <laughs> I just like hey, I'm gonna go with the theme. <laughs> You're it's a just CR three creature. Yeah, it's CR three, but this thing feels so much higher. <laughs> it does, and like because of just the, the raw like resistances it has. It's yeah. just it ooh, it's look cool. Like a chrysalis wormling. It could be. Like does, it for... looks like a crystal wormling because like that's terrifying. Uh, that's not what I envisioned. I actually have a picture of a very nice big giant blue, dark and sky blue golem monster that I used for it. Mm -hmm. But you totally can make it a chrysalis dragon. Um, yeah, and it's you, it falls well within that. all the 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 metrics of that CR. Um, it is worth noting, and I don't know that I included that in the thing or if I read it. Um, it can only do the sonic resonance. Uh. It's supposed to be once a day. It looks like I left it as a... No, no, I weakened it a lot. Yeah, it's supposed to be... Uh, the, the chain can be once a day. Uh, the recharge was from the dragon's breath, so I got to fix that once per day. Uh, because it evolves every time it uses it and it runs out. I think it's normally how Roar works. Um, now, the saves are weak. Um, 13 is pretty That's easy true. to hit. 13's not um, super crazy. But the fact the second one can paralyze you and the third one can really mess your shit up. Uh, oh, it makes terrifying. a lot of fun. Yeah. It, it, like, like the saves are easy, but that's because it's terrifying. <laughs> yeah. That's after you get to that, that third resonance, like, uh, 40, 10 damage at, if you're assuming with a party of four with level threes, that's, that's, that's going to hurt. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that, and that's the same as like the fire breath damage, if I'm not mistaken. So like yeah. I said, it's within damage scales, but, uh, anyways, I love this monster. High. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And it, it's a lot of fun. Uh, and I say that as if I've played, I have not thrown it at my group yet, but uh, um, still very I'll, cool. I'll be honest, this is totally a robot for uh, for our capes and crooks uh, okay. <laughs> game oh <laughs> that uses sonic <laughs> attacks to to to, uh, to to beat the heroes into submission. Um, I will attempt to fight it for you. <laughs> <laughs> so. Yep. All right, uh, I do love uh, Alex's idea of having it in a cave and having stalactites as a lair action, and the resonance mm -hmm. is causing them to drop from the ceiling. Uh, I would totally be all over it. Some really cool. Uh, if you wanted to make it like a legendary monster, you could probably make it do some really funky uh, stuff with like the stalactites and making things happen with that too. I could yeah. see it. Absolutely. So, all right. I think that'll do it for our monster variant, the Chrysalis Golem. If you like these sorts of things, um, every week I publish these out to our patrons on our Patreon at patreon.com slash Crit Academy. It becomes a full nice sheet with lore and backstory and all that stuff. Uh, even uh, lore checks you can feed to your players when they want to know about it, which is nice. Mm -hmm. uh, all I right. Like it a lot. That'll do it. Uh, Austin, would you like to tell us about our encounter of the podcast? I love encounters. Yes. Uh, our encounter of the podcast is Secret Poisonous Portals. Try saying that five times fast. I can't. Uh, this encounter finds the characters in a complex structure filled with a series of rooms with secret doors. Yay, time for us to get lost. Uh, this could be a dungeon, yeah. a nobleman's mansion, a thieves' den, or similar location. Now, uh, once they enter a room, the door they entered through is barred and under the effects of the arcane lock spell. The characters must pass through the area using a skill challenge that takes them through a series of rooms while the rooms fill with the poisonous yellow-green fog of the Cloud Kill spell on Initiative 10. The nature of the poisonous gas forces the characters to act quickly in this time-sensitive situation. The characters must gain six successful skill checks before gaining three failures. The char characters are clever and skill challenges are malleable. If a player offers a potential salute solution, not situation, I guess that could work too, uh -huh. not listed here, allow it so long as it makes sense. Uh, this could take the form of a feature, spell, or clever use of tools. As we have all kind of agreed here, if you can use a clever use of any tools that you have on your character, we generally like that. So That's how we roll. please do. <laughs> uh, so the first one we have here is detecting the door. Now you could use investigation DC 15. Uh, the character feels around the walls, floors, and ceilings and locates a mechanism that pulls down, pivots centrally, pulls indeed, and up or slides to either direction that reveals a door. 
You could also use Perception for detecting the door. The DC is 19, though. Uh, the character can spot a faint hidden catch, thin handholds at the edges, a faint ridge along the side, or similar feature indicating a door's presence. Now, opening the door. You can athletics it with, like, most doors that you can try and punch or open with. <laughs> punch the door. Uh, yeah, punch the door. I cast punch. I cast punch. Yeah. We, 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 we know the motto here. <laughs> We all know. We all understand. Uh, athletics DC 19, because of course. Uh, the character attempts to use brute strength to force open the door, punching, pushing, pulling, kicking, or lifting the door open. Now uh, DC 19, of course. Now, if you have this character, maybe you could use Thieves Tools, which is significantly easier at DC 14. The character is able to use pins, hooks, wire, and additional tools that fit into a latch, padlock, or similar locking mechanism. Success and failure. Success and failure in this challenge are measured by the threat and the damage of the poisonous gas. If the characters fail the skill challenge, they still escape the poison rooms, but must succeed on a DC 15 constitution saving throw or gain one level of exhaustion. That's very, obviously, painful. Exhaustion is not fun for anybody. <laughs> yeah. Especially when the whole thing is based on skill checks. Exactly. Yes, I, yep. I am a huge... Just... Go ahead. Ooh. Uh, well, I was just going to say that, that that duo right there, like possibly getting exhaustion and the majority of what I was hearing is base skill checks. That's just a, mm -hmm. a nasty combination. Yeah, well, skill challenges are hands down my favorite, the best mechanic to come out of 4th edition that was never introduced in the 5th edition. And it's a shame uh, because it really fills out that exploration and lore aspect of the game very, very well. Um, so what do you guys <laughs> overall think about this in in encounter? I've always been okay. a fan of your skill oh. challenges. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I, did, I always enjoy these. Yeah. My first thought is um, crazy wizard. <laughs> I'm <my first> <laughs> like, I honestly dig it. I dig it so much. First of all, any way that you can reinvent the wheel to try to make a concept revive again and have it do something that, you know, people who have been playing five, six, seven, eight, nine years, you know, we've all seen this or that or then we have all seen all these things but like the way that it was really set up it really felt like you like reinvented the wheel and like put a nice new coat of paint on something that's you know like you said was in 4e and like you just put a nice new coat of paint of it and stick it in 5e and there yeah. we go and it, it actually sits really well and i'm i'm gonna go reread that <laughs> and uh, take some lessons from it um, definitely yeah and it's one thing because uh 4E got a bad rap for a lot of different reasons, but it had mm -hmm. some really cool shit in it, and this was definitely one of them. Yeah. Um, yeah. So overall, I like this one. Uh, I specifically didn't want failure to be outright death, um, okay. though they I actually do want to talk about that. Actually, if okay. I could, yeah, I've had so, it. So I'll allow it. Uh, I <laughs> I think the best design about this is the fact that failure does not mean no entry failure does not mean dying failure means you still get to get through you still accomplish what you wanted to do in this situation but there is a penalty yes. attached to it and i think that is by far one of the best game design things you can do because you are still progressing you are still right. moving forward it's just harder now and i think that is something that you do very well in every single skill challenge before yep. you give me too much credit it's worth noting cloud kill does <laughs> damage and it can kill you but you're not gonna yeah. die from the from the skill challenge <laughs> that's the the point is the skill challenge isn't killing you yes it's the cloud kill that's killing yes. you. that's acceptable yes cloud kill is supposed to kill <laughs> and that was and that it has the name kill in it. it has kill in its name it's exactly <laughs> yeah yeah it's supposed to kill you uh ian do you have anything yeah, I'm not gonna lie. It just took me a lot of willpower to not say anything until now. This this is a fun skill challenge. Don't get me wrong, but, but... you know, I rather, I'm like stone shape. What? <laughs> Make fact, doors. Like, I can just picture a, a DM monologuing about. Okay, here's a skill challenge, and here's what you have to do. Player stone shape. Wait, what? <laughs> you know what? And oh, that's what a re that's I'll what just... that resource is for. I yeah, would be I'm like, like oh, opening. Do it, and then you get into the next room. You got to use it again to get out of that room, but still consuming resources. And you notice I included the detail about the malleable skills and, okay. and, and, and clever thinking because no skill challenge is going to count for everything. And if you show up, you know what? I have stone, uh, stone, whatever prepared today. I'm going to shape stone and make a door. I'll be like, fuck yeah, let's go. 
Or, not uh, only that, but uh, Stone Shape is a fourth is a fourth level spell. So yep. if you had Stone Shape, you probably have other things to get through yeah. this. <laughs> mm -hmm. Also, and I'll spell part of that too. I remember like playing in ye olde game of Pathfinder first edition, where we were going to like a dungeon that had multiple floors mm -hmm. that went down. Like the magic has three base with floors. You gotta fight your way through. Stone Shape, Stone Shape, Stone Shape. Okay, we're on the battle floor. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, that's those sure. moments. That's those moments whenever you're a dungeon master, you're so pissed, but you're so, so proud. proud. Yeah, yeah, I'm right there with you. Uh, All right. Uh, like, no, it hurts, but good job. Especially <laughs> when you like write this stuff out and you want like you just like you just <laughs> bypass it. Well, I'm gonna reflavor this and move it over here. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, I think that'll do it for our encounter. Um, Alex, I did send you the show note links to your Twitter. So if you'd be willing to take the DM tip when we get to it, that would be great. Ian, yeah, absolutely. would you like to tell us about our magic item? Definitely. Our magic item today Love is it. the Scorch Rose. It is wondrous and uncommon. This red and orange flower can be found around lava pits or near areas where lava flows regularly. Ooh, some liquid hot magma. When a spell <laughs> of first or higher level is cast and it deals fire damage, you can add the Scorch Rose to the material components of the spell. If you do, targets that take fire damage from the spell must exceed a DC 15 con save, begin burning, and take an additional 2d4 damage at the start of each of their turns for five turns. Stop retyping it! I'm reading it! <laughs> <laughs> if the target... An ally within five feet of target can use an action to put out the burning flame and this effect. The score. <laughs> Sorry. Your academy thing popped up as you're typing. Sorry. Hey, what's <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, an ally or target within five feet of the guy who's burning can use an action to put out the burning flames to end the effect. Scorch Rose is consumed by the spell. Nature attack of DC 17 is required to harvest a flower or suffer the effects of burning hand spell. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, I saw so it was originally it said fireball. I was like, oh my god. Yeah. No. So I always I forgot. I don't know how I forgot fire. that. I forgot. I always include harvest details on these in skills for them, and I realized I forgot that. I was like, crap. Where's it at? I gotta go add it. So I'm <laughs> typing as he's reading. <laughs> Uh, what you actually blocked the text I was reading. Sorry. So. so what do you guys what do you guys think about this? So as a okay. guy who just recently uh, read solo leveling all the way through so far, uh, I love things that boost certain elements of spells. I've realized that that is something that isn't in D and D, yet. and it should be in D and D. So me seeing it. this makes me very happy. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Plus, uh, also like damage over time effects just don't seem to happen very often in D and D. Yeah, Which they're pretty. Burn. They're no. pretty rare. Uh, in Capes and Crooks, I actually created another two more conditions. One is shocked, which is basically the can't take reactions, and another one is burning because yeah. they they're missing and they needed to be in there. Just in my like opinion, this? yeah. yeah. Uh, because mm. that's for the simple nature of five E, I think. But um, uh, Alex, what do you think? Uh, I think it's super fun. I, of course, like anything that um, kind of enhances what you already have. And so I, I don't know. I, I think this is really fun. And I love the imagery and, like, just what w what you could do with, like, getting mm -hmm. a rose. Yes. Like, I love the imagery of the rose, and I love what the potential of like hey you, you know if you're going to this wizard tower over there if you go just a couple miles this way there's a volcanic opening and if you go there and pick a rose and then there's like fire um fire elementals or something like that or like uh methods or something i just right. i think that would be a really neat um i like this because you can tie it into so many things yeah absolutely <laughs> and uh i'm really big on consumable items and consumable magic items that give you a temporary buff. The fact that it ties so the fact that it ties into the material components of something that's completely ignored 90% of the time in games just makes mm -hmm. it that much better because now you know when the wizard goes to cast his fireball and he reaches into his pouch and he he waves his hands over this glowing rose and it slowly spirals into a burst of fire and the fireball grows in his hand. You can feel it thrumming and the power waiting to escape just 
evoke such an uh, amazing uh, experience as a, as a wizard and DM. And so having something that's consumable, you get it once, it forces the players into the horde mode. It's like, I got to save this. I got to save it. And they never actually use the damn thing because they got to wait for the yeah. right moment. But I also want it to be something that can be harvested. So is there dangerous dangers of harvesting, you know, magical reagents? Well, yeah, it'll basically tor- scorch you with a, a, a turn to fire. And I'll be honest, I 100% was playing Mario when I thought of this. And I picked up the little flower and I started shooting fireballs out of my hands. I'm like, that needs to be a magic item. Yeah. So and you did, you did it. And there it is. <laughs> <laughs> I think that'll do it. Keep it keep an eye out for more of these because I'm gonna keep making more because I think it would make for a fantastic D and D supplement product. Wizards components. I need to come up with a really you cool know, name. It's funny because this made me think, I was like, hmm, what if Brick took a feat that every day he was allowed to roll on like a chart and make it consumable? <gasps> like a cooking feat? Yeah, hell yeah. Uh, Justin loves this idea, and Brooke, Brooke is very happy with idea, he thinks. <laughs> I think this be really good. Make stew taste great. <laughs> All right. I think that would be, be really fun. Well, if you need somebody to create some of these things, I know a guy. <laughs> I'm totally down here. Let's create. Let's do it, man. <sighs> That'll do it for our magic item, the Scorch Rose. Alex, would you like to tell us about our Dungeon Master tip? Absolutely. Uh, Suspense relies on making sure that you build towards a climax with a powerful and vibrant narration. Words are very important. For example, water drips from the ceiling of the dungeon of the dungeon corridor ahead. As you make your way, roll a perception check. An 18. Nice. You hear a strange scraping sound in the distance, as though something very heavy and sharp were being dragged along the cavern floor. The sound grows louder and louder, as though the source is closing in on your location. Uh, using a build-up like this before you reveal a monster and start an encounter is one way to build suspense and anticipation uh, in the mind yes. of the player. And not just that, but whenever you choose particular words, you're going to make the player's brain think particular thoughts. Mm-hmm. And you can, like, psych them out. You can uh, make them think one thing and it's actually another. Uh, Words are very, very... As a person who is extremely dyslexic and words are very hard, words are (laughs) very powerful. And it's very important as a dungeon master to use your words efficiently. Yes. Mm -hmm. The one thing I really want to note on the Build Suspense DM tip is also the way it does it. Usually... And I'm guilty of this. I ask for the check in advance, then read it. I like the idea of reading a description, then calling for it, and then moving on. And that seems to, in my opinion, and that's something, once again, I, I ripped right from one of my 4 books. Did I pick a good enough font for you? I couldn't remember which one it was you liked. Uh, oh, I, I switched it to Comic Sans. Oh, okay. It's okay. <laughs> awesome. That works. Which one did I have in there? Wasn't good enough. Or never uh, good enough. I think it was. I. I. It wasn't switched. I think it was still. Um, Sad face. Roman. Well, that's yeah. a shame. Uh, all right. So uh, overall, I think that uh, it's important to to use your words in describing uh, the the to build suspense, especially when it comes to monsters. You know, not just saying you turn the corner and there's a golem. That's not nearly as exciting as you turn the corner and you see this massive hulking shadowy figure mushrooms growing upon its body its stony head turns slowly and creaks and as it looks at you it's just so much cooler than or even like you can even take the steps before that as in like you're about to round the corner and you hear just (laughs) these you can see my camera move but I'm I'm pounding my desk (laughs) (laughs) Um, and you see just this, you, you hear as you step and you feel the vibrations in as if something is walking and as you turn the corner, then you see the description of the goal, which I think would be very good too. Wonderful. It's the the idea that you have these things. Whenever I was in classes and stuff and like learning to read and stuff and learning to, to write and spell, uh, one of the things that they said to do was, um, start 
start from one side of the creature and then go to the other side or start from the bottom and go to the top mm -hmm. and kind of whenever you do that whenever you do that scan of the creature what ends up happening is like more and more becomes revealed and it's like it makes your heart go faster and faster um and so that's like a I really like fun way to build suspense another thing that i think is really important is to remember to diversify the words that you use to describe <laughs> your characters yes your, your monsters absolutely make it makes a big difference um yes. it does all right uh great tip thank you very much uh alex that'll do it for our dungeon master tip build suspense suspense, dun, dun, suspense, dun. suspense. or build suspense but uh <laughs> No? Okay. Whatever. Okay. <laughs> hey, whatever. <laughs> uh, um, that'll do it for our Dungeon Master tip. Our player tip of the podcast is... Don't, don't be a dick. dick. That was horrible, but hey, good job. <laughs> I did it this time. We got it right in the I first remember. time. What she, do you mean? She got Seth it. it. Seth, Seth it was, fixed. It's my, third to, it's my third try, and I finally remembered to do it. <laughs> uh, today we have the five top uses for the forgery kit skill <gasps> players are gonna love this i like this already let's talk about deception a well-crafted forgery such as papers proclaiming you to be a noble or a writ that grants you safe passage through hostile territory or a naval vessel can lend credence to any deceptive lie how about <laughs> Perfect. how about investigation when you examine objects such as artwork or official documents proficiency with the forgery kit is useful in determining how an object was made and whether it is genuine definitely can allow you to determine the value a lot better too which is nice how about a history check a uh, forgery kit combined with your knowledge of history improves your ability to recreate fake historical documents or tell if the old document is authentic. How about a variety of other features? How about the knowledge of other tools makes your forgeries that much more believable? believable allowing you to combine expertise of both for example you could combine proficiency with a forgery kit and proficiency with a cartographer's tools to make a high quality fake map to a secret I'd treasure oh for some reason to use two tools at once yeah Why have i never thought of that? i'm gonna be honest i wouldn't have thought about that but this is a segment that i honestly only skimmed over previously in xanathar's guide to everything <laughs> yep. uh so this is not me saying you can do this this is wizards of the coast let's make sure that's clear which is something i had never considered and double proficiency, yeah. uh, because you have you can leverage that. That's fantastic. How about a quick fake? As part of a short rest, you can produce a forged document no more than one page in length. As part of a long rest, you can produce a document that is up to four pages long. Your in <laughs> oh, your intelligence check for using the forgery kit determines the DC if someone's intelligence investigation is to spot the fake. Um, right. So I'm going to be honest. This came right from my Xanathar's Guide to Everything that, honestly, I skipped right by previously. It was like, yeah, keep going. And there's a whole lot more of those, so expect some of those. So what do you guys think of this? Good. Uh, so fun. My f I, uh, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> I was going to say, my assassin just got upgraded so fast, dude. <laughs> you have no idea. <laughs> I'm just like, bro, I could do so much. And since we're going to be playing in, like, an Eberron like campaign i'm gonna be like i'm gonna forge so many bills my tab is always gonna be free <laughs> <laughs> oh so, yeah that I'm other so guy ready. covered it for me here's the paperwork <laughs> yeah it's like i don't know what you want says so it's paid already what were you gonna say alex oh my god oh i was just gonna say that like i love this simply for the fact that toolkits are so underutilized in five yes years. oh my true. god i there are so many kinds of cool toolkits. It's so cool. Players, new players are so excited to be have a forgery kit, have a cartography kit. They're so, for, you know, all of these, all of these kind of things, and then it you never use it. So yes. I love this because it's just another way to use something that Wizards of the Coast gave us and then everyone kind of forgot about. Yes, absolutely. Ian, mm. do you have anything? Besides skill kits in general computer. just need to be used more often, and there's not enough detail in them as there should be. But stuff like yeah. this flushes them out, and that's always a plus. Especially a smart player can do a lot of things with one. 
Yeah, and you guys, and uh, that's one of the reasons why I actively try to make an effort in the uh, you, when I write the encounters and stuff. You've seen where I've included the tool usages. Mm -hmm. I didn't include it in this one because honestly, I didn't think of it fast enough to include that. But um, generally, when I do those sorts of things, because I want those to be tools that can yeah, tools tools that can be used to advance the the story and the characters that took them. I think in one point we talked about using cobbler tools. Um, for somebody to make shoes to walk across hot coals. I don't remember what the bull crap was, but just including weird things like that in the encounters is something I think uh, uh, not only myself as a D&D content creator, but Wizards of the Coast should be actively putting an effort to, towards. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise, it feels like they don't get as much love. So, uh, for sure. Yeah, Absolutely. use that forgery kit, man. It's super awesome. It could do so much stuff. The idea of drawing up a fake map to treasure to trick the other people you're fighting to race to a treasure is just great. Um, so, all right, that'll do it for our player tip of the podcast. Don't no, be a dick. dick. That was pretty good. Uh, you five, tie, five top five uses for a forgery kit skill. Use it. Love it. Use it, I just love never it. thought to use it to like make sure something is authentic. I think that's the one that really got yeah. me. Yeah, making sure it's, it's a good, one. good. But see, that also mm -hmm. comes down to making sure that like if you approach me and ask me that, I'm like, shit, I better start tossing some fake shit into my games. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like that's that's how I'm I'm very too mm -hmm. reactive as a DM. All right, that'll do it for our show today. Oh, I want to thank Alex so much for joining us here. We have another a surprise guest. Yeah, yeah, before we close yeah. out, uh we have another gift to give away. Ian, would you like to tell us about it? I certainly. Our giveaway is tap untap. Earn five color mana spell point variant rules. It's cool stuff. Replace spell slots in the eight schools of magic with spell points in the five color magic paradigm. Where's that from? White Magic the Gathering, obviously. But and, and it redefines spellcasting for a D and D fifth edition. It works yeah. really, really well. Holy crap! I read through this thing, and I my mind was literally blown. There's a huge crossover between magic and uh, D and D right now, especially mm -hmm. with the Magic the Gathering cards that are coming out in that take place in mm -hmm. Forgotten Realms, plus with Ravnica, which is a D and uh, a Magic the Gathering setting, and and all the little sub things that they've released. This goes perfect with it, um, and it this works so well. Too. What's that? Theros. Oh yeah, Theros. Duh. Totally forgot about that one. <laughs> <laughs> Who's our winner? Our winner today is Jobs Delgado. Woo! <laughs> Congratulations. Awesome. Win? Not a problem. Head over to CreateGamer.com and subscribe for your chance to win and check out our other free stuff we give away. It's good stuff. Yeah, we always have good stuff here. We'd like to make it rain on our fans. Uh, like if we were at like a, a tavern, I'd be rain. I'd be singing a chorus of awesome music from my minstrel uh, that would just leave your jaw dropped on the ground. Uh, before we close out, Alex, thank you for joining us. Why don't you take this opportunity to plug yourself and the upcoming initiative and intrigue? Cause I'm tell people about it, please. Well, hi, my name is Alex Baum, misspelled, of course, because I'm extremely dyslexic. Um, I am a TikTok content creator as well as a Twitch content creator on TikTok. I mostly focus on things to help dungeon masters and on uh, Twitch. We um, just noodle around with Dungeons and Dragons. Like in 30 minutes uh, from now, we're going to be doing... Um, we're going to be deciding what races would make what alcohols. I have a big long <laughs> list of different kinds of alcohol and we're going to decide who makes what. Um, and there's been a big fight over who makes absinthe. There's <laughs> a big fight over who makes that. So, um, yeah. And uh, I am also the dungeon master of the show that is coming out next Friday, May uh, 21st at 6 30 central time that Justin is going to be playing his beloved character Brick on and um, it is all about um, it is all about old tales intertwining with new tales and most importantly synergy and interactive D&D &D. because you all if you watch are going to be in a race against Brick and the rest of the players to revive the dead god of the dead god of death and revenge before they are able to reach level 8 and if you do uh, it goes on meat grinder mode <laughs> So yeah, it's going to be so much fun. Uh, I love it so much. I'm so excited. This cast is 
absolutely amazing. We all vibe together really, really well. And I hope I hope you check it out. Please do. And now this is made by fairies, obviously. So hmm. it's made by fairies. Obviously. Obviously. <laughs> <laughs> All righty. Uh, thank you for that. Hopefully uh, that'll do it for our show today. Once again, Alex, thank you so much for coming on and filling in. Um, I don't know what happened, but unfortunately our guest didn't make it. I didn't even get a comment yet from him. So uh, hopefully he's okay. Um, if you enjoyed our show and you'd like to support, oh, please join us on our next episode. We're going to be discussing the Complete Armorer's Handbook. If you're a player who loves crafting or a DM that likes to include that sort of stuff, you're going to be blown away by this book. It is, uh, oh my gosh, like... I, I have to include this in my upcoming Eberron slash Ravnica campaign so, uh, because it was so great. Uh, anyways, uh, if you enjoy the show and you want to support us, please head on over to CritAcademy.com. Follow us on social media. Leave us a review. Consider checking out our Patreon page. We give away lots of fat loot to all of our patrons. Um, lots. Like I just released, uh, released our monthly Unearthed Tips and Tricks, fully published and all that stuff. It's a lot of fun. Uh, or just pick up one of our products or send us a message on our social media saying, hey, we like your show. All right. I am your host, Justin. Alex. I'm the guest, Alex. <laughs> your host, Ian. They're lying all the time. <laughs> and I'm your co-host, Austin. Thanks for listening. Keep your blades sharp and spells prepared, heroes. Thank you guys for joining us today. See you guys.